This is a production of Cornell University. And now I'd like to introduce my fellow panelists. Um, we're, we're absolutely thrilled to have Grandel Keenan from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, where he's professor of English and comparative literature. Professor Keenan is the author of the novel, The Visitation of Spirits, and the fiction collection, Let the Dead Bury Their Dead. His books on black American lives, those of others and his own, include Walking on Water, and more recently, The Fire This Time. He has edited Uncollected Writings of James Baldwin and written a young adult biography of Baldwin. He's also taught creative writing just about everywhere. Uh, Sarah Lawrence, Columbia, Vassar, Duke, you miss, and uh, of course, Chapel Hill, and it's such a pleasure to have him here today. Um, we're also very lucky to welcome back Kenneth Anderson McLean, uh, Emeritus W.E.B. Du Bois Professor of Literature at Cornell. Uh, Ken has been a beloved presence in our community for so long. <laughs> He's an extraordinary writer, teacher, and activist. And his work is gathered in Take Five Collected Poems, and he also has published two collections of essays, Walls, um, which was reprinted, reprinted in 2010, and Color, which appeared from Notre Dame Press. I'm Alice Fulton. As I said, I've written poetry, fiction, and essays. I've taught elsewhere, but now I teach here. <laughs> so, I'll begin. Um, Bob, so few contemporary writers have written both poetry and fiction, as well as you do, seriously, at length, and having two, almost two separate careers in a way. Um, of course, there are examples from the past, Paul, um, Thomas Hardy, and I'm just curious, one of the great pleasures of reading your novels for me is the beauty of the language. And I wondered what poetry brought, what you brought from poetry to your fiction, and also what you might bring from fiction to poetry. How are the two sort of cross-pollinating in your head, or, or cohabiting in your head? And to follow that up with, why do you think so few writers even attempt both genres? Is it because there's such different sorts of thinking that you do for each? And what does each give to each? I don't think the writer writes both fiction and poetry is as rare as we tend to think. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe, equally known as a poet and a fiction writer and critic, mm -hmm. as far as that goes. Thomas Hardy, D.H. Yeah. Lawrence, they're not quite as rare. <laughs> uh, but the contemporary writers? Uh, Robert M. Warren. Uh, but I think that I learned a lot from writing poetry I used in writing fiction, having to do with the economy of language, uh, the listening to the cadence, the feeling for the sound. We live in a mostly visual world. This is something I talk to students about often. And we're not used to listening to language, perhaps the way our ancestors did. And poetry is an oral, oral art. And you will notice that uh, so many of the famous novelists began as poets, or thought of themselves as poets, Faulkner, Hemingway, uh, etc. So I don't think I would have been the prose writer I am if I had not been a poet all those years. Mm. Does it work the other way? But it also works the other way, that if you are learning to think in terms of fictive space, You've heard me say this before, that in writing poetry, we're thinking of the line. Mm. You know, writing a line, where it breaks, and where it starts and ends again. Whereas writing fiction, you're thinking of this imaginary space that you create one word, one detail, one sentence at a time. And uh, if you can bring that to your poetry writing, it gives another dimension to it. Of its poems can often be narratives, usually more compressed than prose narratives. So they really do enhance each other. And uh, I now can't imagine, you know, not doing both. Uh, sometimes a story or an idea seems better as a poem, as a story. But I've gotten a lot of ideas for poems while writing prose. Come across a 
image, a metaphor, a phrase that just seems to be a poem in here a poem. You've said that your poems begin with metaphor. I, I've heard that from you. And I wondered if you bring that Alice, metaphor. Can you speak up a little bit more? Oh, sure. Oh, OK. Thanks, John. So I've heard, that, I've heard you say that your, your uh, poems begin with metaphor very often. And I wondered if that entered into fiction, if you bring a sense of metaphor from poetry into fiction, if metaphor is important to your fiction writing. Well, metaphor is almost the basis of language create names, we name one thing in terms of another. So the metaphor is, is just very much a part of what language is, seeing one thing as something else or connected to something else. Uh, the finest definition of the poetic imagination I've ever heard was from uh, Madison Smart Bell giving a lecture, I think in Chattanooga, he said the poetic imagination is holistic animism. <laughs> You know, holistic because everything is connected and, and animism because everything's alive. The poet sees everything alive. And uh, we go back, you know, behind the rational mind that separates everything, as Shelley says, to the metaphoric imagination, which instead sees the connections and the likeness uh, between things. So, yeah, you know, all of our names are metaphors. So it's the metaphoric impulse, probably, that was behind the, the evolution language of the day. Then the romantics, uh, like von Herder, essentially say that, that it is the poetic imagination that gave impetus to the creation of language. Uh, not utilitarian purposes, but for the sheer pleasure of making the sound that describes something, that evokes something, and then of telling stories, the delight of telling stories. It's his book called Ursprung der Sprache, the, the origins of language. Um, okay. Um, well, first to say how humbling it is, and perhaps even fitting, for me to be paying homage to a man who writes a hog killing better than I do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the only one. I uh, wonder about that. <laughs> uh, and before I start, I have to tell you this story. I never told you this before. Every once in a while, the University of North Carolina English Department loses their minds, <laughs> and they allow me to teach Southern literature. And I teach a course focused on North Carolina literature, and, and you, your stories and your poems figure in that. And one and before this, for this to make sense, you have to realize that most of my students these days don't—they aren't swamp rats like me or mountain birds like Robert, but they're from the suburbs of Atlanta, from northern New Jersey. From <laughs> <laughs> so we're reading *Mountain Bride*. If you don't know *Mountain Bride*, this a newlywed couple—they build a house on top of a nest of rattlesnakes, and when they like the, the, the chimney, the rattlesnakes come up and kill them. Yeah. And the last line has the, the, mentions the hungry snakes. And this young woman pipes up. And she says, Professor Keaton, why didn't they eat them? The snakes. Why didn't the snakes eat the snakes? So that, that, I was forget that. <laughs> Matt, you finally got it, yeah. Um, Bob, I think I told you this. We, we had a, sm a small bit of a conversation at a dinner. Uh, maybe in Chattanooga, uh, about Boone. And I will never get over that book. And for the young people, you have no idea. I'm of the generation that grew up on Fess Parker, <laughs> right? Uh, Fess Parker, he also, this, this is all Walt Disney's fault. <laughs> he produced these, these television series. He, first, he produced a movie where Fess Parker played um, what's his name? Davy Crockett. Davy Crockett. Crockett. Davy yeah, Crockett. Yeah, yeah. King of the Wild Frontier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then there was this long series of, um, of, 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 of episodic television starring Fess Parker as Daniel Boone. And, and me as a little boy, growing up in the swamps of southeastern North Carolina, identified with all this, 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 this external uh, uh, world, living in the forest and whatnot, and then I get, you know, X number of decades later, I read your book, and it's like you grabbed me by the scruff of the neck and shook me and said, here, son, this is what really that world was like. Uh, and it's just a remarkable 
bit of research and you brought, it's, it's almost, I, sometimes I think of it as science fiction because you recreate uh, that world. I mean, I thought I understood Quaker culture. By God, they're, they were so strange and so marvelous. And we think we walk today. We think we go on hikes. Even if you, if you walk across the Appalachian Trail compared to what Boone did, it's nothing. You just took a stroll. So can you talk about the evolution of that book and what you and Shannon were able to accomplish? Well, the origins of the biography of Boone go back to my childhood. Because <laughs> my dad was a great fan of Daniel Boone, and uh, he always said we were related to Daniel Boone, whose mother was a Morgan, and this turned out to be true, a very distant relation. But I grew up uh, uh, in a place where there were artifacts from the Indians, hoe and corn, or something would turn up, pieces of pottery and arrowheads. So I always had, felt that connection to, to that world, the frontier, and the Cherokee Indians in this case, uh, and the world of Daniel Boone. But the, the thing that really got me interested in writing the book on Boone was writing the novel uh, Brave Enemies, where I did a lot of research on the revolution uh, uh, leading up to the Battle of Calpan. Well, that was Daniel Boone's world, of course. And, and uh, when uh, my publisher asked if I would be interested in writing a biography, I said, well, I would uh, of either Edgar Allan Poe or Daniel Boone. And they, they chose Boone. <laughs> the marketing staff chose Boone. And it was wonderful to have an excuse to do that research. I fell in love with the research. Uh, I went to Kentucky at least 12 times, and to Pennsylvania where he was born. I went to a number of archives, including Chapel Hill, and uh, the Kentucky Historical Society, the Missouri Historical Society. I went to his house in Missouri. Uh, Boone left a big paper trail. He, he was literate. He was an important figure. He was a politician. He was a he was a surveyor, he was a real estate man. Uh, so uh, I also had the help of several historians, who were very generous to share with me their collections and to take me to the sites of the forts in Kentucky that Boone had helped build, and to the site of his uh, store on the, Kentucky, uh, the Ohio River. So yeah, it was the kind of work that I think anybody would love. You got to you know walk along the banks of the Ohio, <laughs> uh, which uh, Thomas Jefferson, who had never seen the river, said is the most beautiful river in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and the French called it La Belle Rivière. <laughs> Doesn't Jefferson say that in, in, in notes on the state of Virginia that? that uh, <laughs> Edgar Allan Poe said the same thing, and he'd never seen the Ohio. <laughs> I guess they figured if the French named it uh, La Belle Riviera, it must be, and it is. You can stand on the Great Bridge at uh, Cincinnati and look up and down the river, and you really get a sense of that grandeur. Big Bone Lick, where they found the, the mammoth bones and things. Uh, the French called them elephant bones. They found these elephant bones. Uh, they really have this window on the past, you know, going back to the Ice Age. There's enough left of that landscape so you can really feel it, feel close to it in the mountains. Uh, I uh, started my book tour in uh, Pikeville, Kentucky, because that's where Boone first entered the Cumberlands uh, in uh, 1769. And local historians were excited about the book, and they said, we will take you to Boone's bear hunting camp. Boone made his living hunting bears and boiling them down to oil, like selling bear oil. They said, we know where his camp was, but we have never found a bear. 
<laughs> so we got in their jeep and drove around and around the mountains. And as we were approaching the site, this big black bear jumped out in the road ahead of us and ran <laughs> to the camp. <laughs> I told this to, a, to an Indian friend in Missoula, and he said, oh, the bear wanted you to know it was OK. <laughs> <laughs> so it was just fun from beginning to end, and, and the writing of the book, uh, because as I say in the introduction to it, you know, the first writer, the prose writer I was ever really involved with was Thoreau. This was like living with Thoreau, I to go back to Boone's letters and account books, and I found a number of things that people had never found before. Uh, there was the legend that uh, Daniel Boone and his sons dug 15 tons of ginseng, put it on a keel boat, pulled it up uh, the Ohio River, up the Monongahela, took it on pack horses across the mountains to Maryland, uh, but lost some of it for water damage. Well, I grew up in a family that's been digging ginseng for 200 years, and I know the stuff is light as paper, you know, when you dry it. 15 tons would fill a warehouse <laughs> or a battleship. I knew there was something wrong with that story. So I traced the story to its source, which is an interview that Lyman Draper did with Boone's youngest son, Nathan, Green County, Missouri, 1851, and got the transcript from the Wisconsin Historical Society. And I was reading that passage where he said 15 tons I suddenly knew he meant T-U-N-S. A T-U-N is a barrel or a keg. It can be any size. And you can put 15 kegs in a keel boat and, and pull it out inside. And then I went to the Draper Collection at, uh, at Madison, Wisconsin, to Boone's account book for August uh, 1788. And he wrote down, bought from Fabian 15 kegs of ginseng. <laughs> he, he, didn't, he didn't bought it, he was a dealer. He didn't, he didn't it. But the other Boone biographers that never dug ginseng had no idea the weight of this stuff. <laughs> so I had several coups like that at the time because I had killed hogs and things. <laughs> <clears throat> well, let me just first of all say that I was very privileged to be in Bob's first class um, oh when I was an undergraduate here. Um, and at that moment, he was not only a magnificent teacher, but he remains probably the most generous human being I've ever met. A lot of writers, excuse my language, are, are real shits. <laughs> no, let me clean it up. Writers are very nice, but they're otherwise occupied. <laughs> okay, but anyway, I, I wanted to ask, there's so much, I, I, I want to ask you about uh, Chasing the North Star, because it's a book that I really love. Um, and I'm going to read this so I'll be clear. Uh, Chasing the North Star is a book about many things, but largely about literacy, learning to read one's life, one's possibilities, and growing into what those self-articulated terms might promise for two slaves in their imaginings of freedom. It involves two characters who are, quote, literate, but in very different ways, and how each needs the other to truly comprehend the world. There's Jonah who, like Frederick Douglass, finagled with the aid of others to gain the ability to read. He's, quote, book smart, as Angel describes him. And there's Angel, who's equally literate, interpenchant to comprehend people's desires, although she cannot read or write. In many of your poems and stories, you remind us of the importance of appreciating the many literacies. Might you talk about that? Well, the inspiration for writing Chasing the North Star was partly the fact that so little Appalachian literature ever included any African Americans or, or the issue of slavery. Uh, though the 
were not big slave plantations in the mountains, but certainly was slavery there. And I wanted to to write a book that included something about uh, that part of history. Uh, there was the story mentioned already this morning of, of the escaped slaves befriended by my great great grandparents and, and the boy, little Willie, they left. He was crippled and couldn't run, so they left him uh, with, uh, with my great great grandparents. And uh, he was killed when he ran to get his blue jacket before a tree fell on it. Uh, and uh, I was shown his grave as a kid. Uh, so I was aware of, of uh, slavery in, in the mountains at, at that time. They had to pretend they had bought him, uh, be accused of violating the fugitive slave law, which was serious stuff uh, at that time. Um, but uh, yes, I wanted to write about, uh, I just wanted to see if I could imagine what it would feel like to be on a plantation in Upper South Carolina and uh, to always, by accident, be allowed to learn to read, because he he serves as the as the assistant to the children on the plantation, and he's there when they're taught to read, so he picks it up from the tutor as they're picking it up, and then is caught, of course, by by his uh, mistress. Who doesn't doesn't uh, turn him in, so to speak, but forces him to read to her. She has headaches and needs somebody to read to her. And uh, it was a story that just took on a life. As I, you know, once I got into the, the narration, and uh, I had an excuse to try to to portray the Appalachian Mountains in 1851. And the culture there, the, boon, the moonshiners, the, the towns, the river traffic. Uh, but the greatest uh, accident uh, really was the discovery of Angel. <laughs> and I did not plan this. <coughs> Probably uh, one of the most important talents a writer has is the ability to recognize a happy accident and to know what to do with it, to make use of it. Because you can't plan everything. I mean, you're writing a novel and you know, things happen. And to recognize you know, what really has potential. And when he heard that sound in the mountain and he climbed up there and sees this light, and then he wanders into this party these slaves are having at 3 o'clock in the morning out there uh, in the mountains, and he runs into an angel who says, my name's Angel, but I ain't no Angel. No angel. <laughs> <laughs> and then I knew I could let her narrate some of the book. And uh, I wrote uh, two versions of her narration. Shannon, working with Shannon, I wrote it in dialect. We worked a long time on that. And then Shannon retired, and a new editor took over, and he thought I think rightly that that dialect would distance the reader some. So I completely rewrote it in very plain grammatical English and explained later that Angel did learn, after she becomes Sarepta, uh, to learn and rewrite. So she's telling the story much later. Because it's very important that the reader feels right there and is not distance. And not, and how, how strange these people talk. Or, you know, how ignorant they are, or something that, that my ambition always in writing about people from the mountains, in this case, African American slaves, is that we're not looking down at them, we're looking from inside, if possible. We're not patronizing. And we want to portray them with as much sophistication as John Cheever would portray suburban people. I mean, if, I don't know if it's possible or not, but that's the ambition. <laughs> that <laughs> that you're, you're, not, uh, you're not really looking down on these people. But that's why when writing about religion, I let the people talk themselves. So, you know, it's not like you're evaluating or judging what they're saying, that you are actually portraying some sense of their experience. I got letters when I published the novel uh, 
the truest pleasure from Pentecostals who said, I never realized anybody could write about the experience of speaking in tongues, uh, these, these, uh, these services. Well, you have given us a mighty voice. Thank you. Thank, <laughs> and you. Thank you. I, I hear all the empathy in, in your novels, Bob. Um, you have great empathy for people separated from you by time, for one thing. You know, hundreds of years ago, hundred or more years ago, um, as well as by, by sex, by gender, and race. You know, in Chasing the North Star, what you've just been talking about. I'm thinking of um, Brave Enemies, how you created a wonderful woman character, Josie Summers, who cross-dresses and fights in the American Revolution. And I mean, what a great leap of imagination and also of empathy in, in doing that. I, I just wonder um, if you are drawn to aspects of history that have been neglected, um, thinking about how you, in the Brave Enemies book, that you wrote about um, the British troops I had not ever really heard the story that way before, the suffering of the British as well as the suffering of the colonists. Um, and you, you placed some of the fighting in the South, of course, where as a northerner I had never read very much about that, the American Revolution in the South. So I wonder if you, in addition to empathy when you create your characters, if, when you think of setting, if you go to a place in order to um, look at the moral ambiguity, to, to look at possibly even create a sense of justice or to make things visible that had been invisible in history. I wonder if that's part of what you're thinking or how you create these wonderful people like Josie Summers and um, you know, in Chasing the North Star, the ones we just talked about. Well, part of the inspiration for writing Brave Enemies was actually living here and knowing many, many literate people finding out that almost none of them had ever heard of the Battle of Calpian. It's a major turning point in the revolution. Four of my ancestors fought in that battle, and I was familiar with it from childhood, and the battlefield is only about 30 miles from where I grew up. So I thought that would be interesting, you know, to <laughs> write about the revolution, uh, uh, and uh, maybe you know, mention things that a lot of readers are not aware of, uh, this tremendous turning point. And, in the revolution. The revolution ended in the south with four great battles at Kings Mountain, Calpins, Guilford Courthouse, and then Yorktown, where Cornwallis surrendered. Uh, uh, so I began to research the revolution in the south. While I was uh, doing that research, I gave a talk at uh, in Boston at the Union Club maybe, to Cornell alums, all these doctors and lawyers people, and uh, one of the questions was, Professor Morgan, what are you working on now? And I said, uh, uh, a novel that culminates at the Battle of Calpian. Absolutely. <laughs> blank looks. <laughs> <laughs> Except for one fellow who was a colonel in the Marine Corps, and he said, we studied the Battle of Calpians on our first day at War College. And I knew that was true, that Calpians is an absolutely classic battle of a smaller, not well-trained, not well-supplied army totally defeating a much larger, better trained army. It's, it's studied in military academies and, and war colleges all over the world, uh, but is not very well known. Uh, when I read from that uh, novel at the Union Club in Chicago <laughs> once and told the story, a historian came up to me afterward and said, don't you know that we got so tired of Southerners in the prison camps bragging about what their grandpappies did in the revolution, <laughs> that we decided we would erase <laughs> some contribution. Now, I don't know if that's a joke. Or <laughs> uh, but I, I, as I was thinking about uh, the Battle of Calpins and the events leading up to it, I, I read uh, Tarleton's memoir, and uh, I read several books about General Morgan, the great victor at Calpin and about the battles of the revolution in South Carolina. More battles were fought in South Carolina during the revolution than any other state. Uh, it's one after another after another. And the depredations of Tarleton's men, I mean, it was real terrorism. Tarleton uh, burned, raped, looted. He, he bragged about the number of women he had raped in South Carolina. Uh, and he went back to England 
and he survived and uh, went to Parliament. He appears in the movie uh, uh, Amazing Grace as Lord Tarleton. Hmm. And uh, I thought, wow, can I really create something this horrible? I mean, we know much more about the Civil War, about the Revolution, but this was a Civil War. It was brother against brother, neighbor against neighbor. It was tarring and feathering. It was hanging. Uh, Tarleton didn't burn people in a church, as, as the fellow does in the movie The Patriot, but he did everything else that that uh, fellow did. The people of South Carolina remember Tarleton uh, about in the same category as, as Sherman, uh, to tell you the truth. Uh, but I thought, you know, what, why not tell this story from the most unlikely point of view you can think of, which is a woman fleeing for her life. She's had to kill her stepfather, uh, encountering this turmoil, this violence. And the happy accident there is she meets the preacher man, the young Methodist. And of course, they get together. So. Uh, it's so interesting that she actually cross-dresses and goes to fight in the war. But she has it to. happened, I know, but um, it's not very often told, I think. It happened several times in the Revolution and even more in the American Civil War. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, to save her life, she has to pretend to be a man. Mm -hmm. The time is so dangerous. And uh, had an excuse to, you know, really portray something about Methodism spreading into the back country. Wesley's followers, hymns. <laughs> uh, makes you think about Shakespeare in a different way, doesn't it? <laughs> um, I don't want to belabor Chasing the North Star too much, because you know how, um, how much I admire that novel. You wrote the most wonderful blur. Oh, I'll tell you, it, it brought tears <laughs> to my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was on a panel not a, a while back um, on the neo-slave narrative, and I happened, and one of my colleagues was my colleague. Uh, Bill Andrews, who is one of the foremost scholars of the slave narrative. And during my talk, I foolishly, while talking about the Confessions of Nat Turner, suggested that the original document was ghostwritten by carpetbaggers. And during the Q&A, Bill Andrews proceeded to rip me a double-wide, three-bedroom, two-bathroom <laughs> orifice <laughs> from which I never recovered. <laughs> and, um, I learned my lesson. Um, and going back to what you were talking about, Angel, the section you did with Angel, uh, which sounds very much like the slave narratives, I want you to, I, want, I never got to talk to you about how would you talk to my students I have right now in my classes who have such a sense of tribalism and representational anxiety about a fellow like you writing about a woman like that. And you know, I like Thurgood Marshall, I would, I would send them to me and I'll set them straight, but I want to know what you would say. Well, I would first talk about the very nature of art, which is about reaching across boundaries of identity. Uh, it would not be very interesting if we could only write about ourselves or for people very much like us. So we've already limited the very nature of art. And novel writing especially is about crossing boundaries of gender, ethnicity, religion, race, time, language. I mean, you know, one of the greatest experiences I've ever had is reading War and Peace. It's a translation from something written in Russian many years ago by a nobleman. I was a farm kid in the mountains of North Carolina, and was sitting there reading it uh, you know, by one light bulb in the bedroom. That's what fiction's all about, reaching across the boundaries and getting into the lives of other people. So if we get concerned about who has a right to write what, it's just going to be impossible. Uh, this liberation, this opening up of space, opening doors to other people's experience, 
to be closed off. I mean, what if somebody had told Homer he couldn't write about Troy? He was blind. He'd never seen the plane of Troy. <laughs> Shakespeare had never been to Denmark. He'd never been to France. <laughs> All you can write is memoir, and you know, it's going to be very, very limited. And in fact, when you're writing fiction, the most important threshold to get through is into the fictive space of the imagination. So that's why the, my breakthrough was writing The Mountains Will Remember Us. Scary as it was to get into the voice of a woman much older than me and to think of what she would remember. What would she think? What does she value? Eudora Welty says in one writer's beginning, we sometimes create our best characters by accident, but most often by going farthest from ourselves. And I know just exactly what she means. It's a very important step to be able to get beyond your experience into the imagined experience. And writers who find it hard to do that struggle to develop beyond the apprentice novel or the building's roman or the memoir. The uh, difference between Thomas Wolfe and Faulkner partly is that Faulkner was able to imagine this great range of characters Thomas Wolfe to write so brilliantly about his own experience, uh, the life he had lived, and the people he had known, uh, as opposed to creating a something. Or a Dilsey. Or the preacher, and, you know, that great sermon at, yeah. at, at the end of uh, Sounding of Fury. All right, I'm going to say something. Um, You've written so many fine stories, but there's a story that's a recent, relatively recent story of yours called The Dulcimer Maker that I think is one of the greatest stories I've ever read. In fact, I'd suggest that, you know, there are stories that you'll remember that you take with you, um, you know, the death of Ivan Illich or something. And I want to, but I really want to look at that story for another reason. Again, very strong woman character, Annie, right? Probably the same Annie also in uh, uh, Return to Gap Creek, I presume. Um, who, by the way, is coming out of the mountains, has a child who has 105 temperature, actually 106, 105, trying to get to the doctor, right? Goes to her in-laws, all of whom have all kinds of reasons not to help her, right? right? Um, and yet makes this incredible odyssey. It's just gorgeous. And the writing, as always, is gorgeous. Can I just read a little bit of this just because I can and I got the power? Um, just a, a lovely little section here that just talks about, right, her incredible, right, sense of decency, right, um, and dignity. Um, just a little thing. Just talking about the doctor's office. Just very, very short. This doctor's office seems so clean after the cab of Edward's army truck and compared to her own kitchen. There was no dirt on the carpet and then Annie noticed a stain on her dress. It looked like grease or maybe tobacco juice. Listen to this last line. She pulled her skirt to the side so the stain would show. God bless you. <laughs> But can you talk to how you were able in that story and other stories to make us not judge her in-laws as harshly as we would? And how do you do that? Well, that story I mean, has several, yeah. several seeds. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One of the ideas was, was not to sentimentalize the dulcimer maker. Mm -hmm. And to show the cost of art is yeah. a cost. We, we, we tend to sentimentalize Appalachian things. And, uh, and I understand that. As we tend to sentimentalize American Indians, actually. We talk about them. Uh, but I must confess that a lot of that story is actually based on my mother's experience. She uh, had a lot of trouble getting a ride because uh, they didn't have a car. Uh, but uh, the story almost wrote itself. I mean, you know, you, you 
got the situation, it's hot, it's, the kid had that nice, you know, the daughter has a fever. Um, I, I think there are a lot of things about writing fiction, maybe that fiction writers don't even want to understand any more than a basketball player wants to know how you get it through the hoop, <laughs> just know they can do it. Uh, but for me, the thing is the weather. Hemingway said, uh, "What you tell what the weather is like. And if you start on a really hot day, it's muggy, and uh, you know, the grasshoppers are in the grass, and the pole beans are going to be picked, and uh, the kids got a fever and they're crying. The story is going to unfold for one's weather details, right? What happens next? What happens next? What happens next? Uh, the brother-in-law won't drive her." husband doesn't have any vehicle at all. Uh, her brother won't drive her, so she just jumps in the truck because he's taking the beans <laughs> to the bean market. And you try to think, what would she think of? You know, she's in a doctor's office and compared to, you know, this dirty truck she's been riding in. It's all right. And uh, she obviously got a stain on her skirt riding in that truck. <laughs> and it doesn't want people in the waiting room to see it. So fiction, uh, when you reach the point where you can see what is going to happen, I call that bedrock. S several people have said, how could you write the scene of a woman giving birth? Well, I mean, if you have this you know, young woman who is beginning to feel labor pains and there's nobody there to help her, and the pains are coming and the baby's going to come, you don't have to make up a whole lot. I mean, you, you know what is going to happen. I mean, she's, you know, a devout person. She's going to be praying, et cetera. So I, th I think of, uh, you know, fiction writing, when you're really in the groove, I mean, you hit that bedrock, and it just goes as it has to go. And if there's a panther on the roof, it's even better. I mean, you know, <laughs> <laughs> trying to come down the chimney. <laughs> but, I mean, Annie's intelligence is just the thing. It's just, it's a, well, you've got I, to realize that everybody's intelligent in the That's true. That's true. That's true. Yeah. You know, if you don't think of a character who's not intelligent, I mean, everybody is intelligent That's right. in, in their life. Those literacy. The, the, the way they see things, the way they perceive things. Don't ever write down to anybody, unless you're writing satire, I suppose. I, I just want to touch quickly on, on your latest project, uh, the biography of Poe. I, you explained so well, Bob, how you got into the Boone bio, and I'm just wondering what got you into wanting to write about Poe. Um, there's a Southern connection, of course, but beyond that, and um, it is so fascinating. I guess the second part of my question is, do writers have to be fascinating in order to attract even an audience or a biographer? Or Because when I read more about Poe, he seemed to construct himself in a certain way and fabricate some of his own uh, interesting, you know, things about his life that weren't true, that caught people's attention, uh, to make himself sound a little better than he was, maybe, in some cases. So, uh, but first of all, I just wondered what got you into Poe, and how that process maybe is different from what you're describing in writing fiction. For example, biography being so wedded to the truth, it seems very different, but you do it, you do it so well. Didn't I say the first sign of a gifted writer is the ability to lie convincingly? <laughs> uh, I've always been interested in Poe, I mean, for obvious reasons. But poems that appeal to young people a great deal. You read one of those poems, you never forget it. I mean, you read Annabelle Lee or uh, The Raven. Had to memorize The Raven in the sixth grade, get up and recite it. Uh, um, I've always thought of Poe as the most interesting American writer because of the controversy about him. He's admired by the French and disparaged by Harold Bloom. Uh, Bloom has said, you know, you can't discuss the, the literary merits of Edgar Allan Poe, he has none. Baudelaire uh, uh, <laughs> thought he was the greatest writer of modern times. Paul Valéry, uh, the French philosopher and poet, said uh, the two greatest geniuses of the past 500 years are Leonardo da Vinci and Edgar Poe. Uh, not Edgar Allan Poe, but Edgar Poe, the, the great French writer. Um, 
I have always been interested in possibly writing about him because of that controversy. As somebody that admired in the rest of the world and disparaged often in the English department. Uh, that in itself is interesting. I also knew his great influence on so many other writers, with Melville, Ruby Dick had just shot through with allusions, you know, from uh, Arthur Gordon Penn, other. Uh, but uh, when the editor at Yale asked me if I would write a biography of Poe, I waited for several months because I thought there's so much that's been written about him. What could I possibly add to this enormous uh, library of, of commentary and biography on Poe? There are more biographers of Poe probably than any other American writer. Uh, he's, uh, Maybe, maybe Twain, I don't know. He's the most popular American writer around the world, with Twain, probably. I remember standing at a party beside uh, Carlos Fuentes, the Mexican writer, and he was reciting Poe's prose <laughs> by <laughs> paragraph. <laughs> uh, but uh, I went back and, and reread some of Powell and discovered there were at least uh, three or four things I could uh, go into about Poe that had not been studied so much. The first was I reread The Raven and realized it was not about mourning, it was about deep, deep guilt. That was my that was my key to going back to Poe. And I went to Ulamoon and realized the same was true. This fellow has done something to women. We feel the guilt about women that he is very, very deep, and he has, it's so deep, he has to present it as mourning. You can't, you can't uh, in the poem Lenore, he's more explicit. So, uh, it is Guy de Vere, who's the narrator of the Raven. So why would Poe feel such unbelievable guilt? Where did this come from? He's an orphan. He. Uh, watched his mother die of tuberculosis. He was almost three. He watched her spitting up blood and gasping for breath. Day after day after day, she was an actress. He had absolutely no money. His father had deserted them. Uh, what was it about that experience, watching this beautiful actress, died at the age of 24, famous actress. She had played 300 roles by the age of 24. She had performed as many as 20 roles in a week and three in one day. Can you imagine the memory you would have to have mm -hmm. to perform repertory like that? These were everything from musicals. She was a better singer than she was actress. And she was a very fine dancer. So Poe inherited, obviously, some of this uh, fabulous memory and sensitivity to music and poetry. And he watches her die. Mm -hmm. And the sensitive kid often blames himself when terrible things happen. Mm -hmm. And he's also very distraught and perhaps angry that she has left him. Mm -hmm. So this is a place to start thinking, how does somebody become Edgar A woman dies every story, and in every poem just about. We're, we're almost out of time, and I have just one more thing I have to ask. Um, some of my students are here, and we've been reading uh, a couple of Rilke's letters to a young poet, and of course he gives uh, advice, and you mentioned earlier about the cost of art, and Rilke, in his first letter, um, says something like, acknowledge to yourself whether you would have to die if you were denied to write. Uh, ask yourself, must I write? Well, some of my students thought that was a little bit harsh. Uh, <laughs> so what do writers, from your perspective, what advice would you give to writers? What do writers need to keep in mind most of all in order to be writers? What is the best advice, the most necessary advice, for someone who wishes to devote their life to writing? Um, what, and what do we do in mo moments of discouragement to keep going? I mean, that was Rilke, but do you agree with that? Or would you say there's something else you would give to a writer to say, looking at you who've done so much and you've done it so beautifully, how, how does a writer continue? How does a writer um, 
decide to go forward and be a writer? What is the way to do that? Well, the unanswerable question. You have been asked at the conferences is, why do you write? That's the hardest question. There are many answers, obviously, to that. Um, but uh, I really have only one word of advice to writers, and that is to persist. So I have taught so many gifted students, other teachers I'm sure will agree with this, you never know which ones are really going to continue and develop as writers. Often the people you think of the most gifted don't, and the people you think of as less gifted are the ones who actually achieve something. Now what that is, that fire in the belly, that necessity for practicing art, for perfecting it, to pushing it, this is true if you were a country music singer, right? it's, the, it's the continual practice, the experience, the, the improvement uh, that makes you an artist. And, uh, you just have to persist. The person who succeeds is the writer who the day after she gets her novel rejected, doesn't get the agent she wanted breaks up with her boyfriend, is able to go back and start revising that novel. Now, I don't know what that is, but some people have that ability. They just don't give up, because novels are hard to, to write, and it takes five drafts or more. I have seen a manuscript of Henry James, where he was doing his fifth revision. <laughs> If Henry James had to revise every sentence, you can imagine what the rest of us. <laughs> so it's really about persistence. And why somebody's crazy enough to do that. I don't know, sometimes it's sheer vanity. You feel you can do it well. You want to you know, show people how well you can write. Sometimes there's a subject you have to write about. Something that's given to you. We don't choose our subjects. They choose us. And uh, it's, it's the person who doesn't give up who achieves it. Whatever it is, they enable them to do that. Whether whether it's you know uh, drinking bourbon <laughs> <laughs> or having the muse who inspires you, <laughs> or uh, I don't know some necessity. It's it's been said that uh, art is compensation we can compensate for our losses or our weaknesses in other ways. Somerset Maugham has the terrible stutter, so he becomes such a fluent writer he can't speak. Faulkner's family loses everything in compensation. He creates Yachma Patafa. Emerson's father dies young, and Emerson uh, not only becomes a preacher, but you know, the greatest preacher of all time, as an essayist and lecturer. It is probably compensation. If you were good at other things, you might do that. But I had the experience at USC Chapel Hill of falling in with a group of very bright uh, young writers who were interested in poetry. They were all from the Northeast, and they'd all been kicked out of the finest prep schools uh, <laughs> in New England, and come to Chapel Hill to be beatniks and writers. And they can talk about line breaks and Robert Lowell Yates and metaphor and that sort of thing. And I learned a hell of a lot from them. Reading poetry with them, talking to them. Uh, one of them is a very bright fellow named W. Carroll. And he kept asking me to see some of my poems. And I was very shy about it. I finally gave him some little poems. And uh, three o'clock in the morning, bang, bang, bang on my door, and there was Dudley and his friend Tim. And Dudley said, "These are so good. I just had to come and tell you." Boy, that's validation. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Bob. This has been so, so generous and wonderful, and um, I'm just thank thrilled. You. So, thank you so much for everything. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.